My name is Scott Young. I'm the executive director here at Muskogee Conservancy. Uh, best job in the world. I'm very privileged to uh, work in nature conservation and to do it every day is just a privilege. And I really, uh, really want everybody to know that I, I thank you, all our supporters, all our volunteers for uh, making what we do here possible. Uh, the Conservancy is all about nature conservation in Muskoka. We're, we're Muskoka's uh, nature conservancy. We're a land trust with 44 conservation properties uh, in every corner of Muskoka. We're in Huntsville. We're on Lake Joseph, Lake Muskoka, Lake of Bays. We're all over Gravenhurst. We've got lots of wetland properties. Uh, we're protecting habitat for species at risk. And uh, we're growing. We're always trying to acquire new properties uh, to protect the natural values of Muskoka that we all love. Um, this uh, type of community uh, programming that we offer wouldn't be possible without volunteers. And uh, Laura Thomas is one of those. And she's been an amazing supporter of the Conservancy over the years. And uh, she's uh, going to do uh, today's webinar on seeding native plants. Uh, Laura has a passion for conservation and landscape design. Uh, she owns a company called Hidden Habitat. And uh, that's a company that focuses on sustainable uh, land management practices by merging uh, good landscape design with sustainable uh, and uh, restoration ecology. Uh, Laura's unique and thoughtful designs demonstrate that healthy landscapes can be beautiful landscapes. Uh, so just thank, thanks to all of you for attending today and thanks to Laura for uh, sharing her time and expertise with all of us. Uh, Laura, we're really excited to uh, learn from you today. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you now. Thanks very much. All right, thanks, Scott. Um... Yeah, I'm excited to, to be here today. I think this is probably one of the largest audiences I've ever talked to. Um, so shortly, I'll just um, share my screen and start the presentation. Um, I just wanted to say, so if there's any questions, I'm gonna recommend that we leave the questions to the end. Um, there definitely will be time for that. And um, if you want, you can put them in the comment section. Um, and then Aaron's going to be moderating that as well. Um, and I think that um, the Conservancy also wanted to know, I think, where people are coming from um, or, you know, logging in from. So if you want to throw that in the comments too, um, I think they'll appreciate that. And uh, we'll get started. So just bear with me for one second. Okay, so you can all see this, see my screen? Thumbs up? Perfect. Okay, so I'm Laura Thomas, like Scott had said. So um, at Hidden Habitat, we do, we're a native plant nursery. So we're growing our own um, plants, harvesting the seeds, cleaning it, and we do sell seeds as well. Um, so I'm going to go through how I do it. Um, but also, um, you know, what's applicable just for like the home gardener, um, because what you would have to do and what I do would be a little bit different. So when it comes to seed collection, um, there's always, there's a, there's are some guidelines specifically when it comes to harvesting wild seed. So first and foremost, you always want to make sure that you get permission from the landowner. Um, typically road sides is kind of fair game. Um, but if it isn't your property, it's always um, the best to ask before. Um, and then also to know what you're collecting. Um, I know a lot of people like to kind of um, see something interesting out in the field, you know, and there's that sense of like wonder and experiment there, which I think is fantastic. Um, but you just want to be cautious of um, not collecting invasive species, propagating them and spreading them and also um, not collecting uh, rare species. So um, you wanna make sure that there's enough kind of plant stock there so that this, 
species can propagate in that ecosystem. Uh, and the North American Native Plant Society, um, which is a fantastic organization, if you're interested in learning more about native plants too, um, they actually have guidelines for collecting wild seed, um, which a lot of these is what we usually go by. Um, and what they recommend is to take no more than 10% of whatever seed is there. So even if someone is has already collected the seed or you see um, that some of it's gone, that you're cautious of that and um, only collecting 10% of what's there. And the reason for that is because obviously we want that plant um, to continue in the ecosystem, lay down more seed and propagate. And there's also a lot of wildlife that will forage um, off of the seeds too. Um, and you may think that 10% is a really small amount, but for the average home gardener, I find that 10% is usually more than enough. Um, often when we go out to collect seed, we tend to take more than we need. Um, and when you think about uh, when a plant sets its seed and it disperses, not all of the seed will make contact with the soil. Um, not all will germinate, some will get foraged. So if you're looking at say like a 2% germination success rate from seed to plant, it's quite low. So we wanna make sure we leave lots of seed. Um, so now uh, when you wanna harvest, it will depend on the species. Obviously some of our really early bloomers like hepatica, for example, you'll be harvesting in, in June um, but typically the harvest season is around late summer to fall. Um, and cues for when to harvest is obviously once it's done flowering and um, the plant itself has kind of gone brown and died back. Um, you wanna make sure that the seeds are properly matured and dried. Um, harvesting kind of immature seeds, you're probably not gonna have a lot of um, success in germinating that. So pictured here is just the common milkweed. Uh, so that's an example of, you know, the seed pods have gone brown. The seeds are themselves are brown and, and um, not green. They look like they're ready to harvest. Um, and if you can collect on a sunny or dry day, and that'll just uh, allow the seed to not have a higher moisture content. If by all means, the only time you can collect is um, on a rainy day, that just means that you wanna dry those seeds out for longer than the recommended three to five days. Um, for me, I collect in paper bags. You can collect in plastic if that's all you have, um, but then just transfer to something more breathable when you wanna dry it out. Um, and don't forget to label them. <laughs> I feel like often people are collecting seeds, they go to dry them and then they forget what they, especially if you're collecting more than one species, you forget what those seeds are. And make sure you get there before the birds do. So this is just uh, a gray headed cone flower um, that, you know, the the finches just obviously went to town on before we were able to harvest. Um, so we didn't get a lot of the gray headed coneflower and this one is always tricky because it's really hard to harvest. Um, you can't harvest it when it's not mature. Um, the window is really, really short. So we did get some seed, but just not as much as in previous years. Okay, so, and this is just a short um, little video about how I harvest common milkweed. Um, so I'm going to play just a couple minutes of it here. Wanted to scoot ahead here. Okay, we're gonna scooch ahead if I can. Oh, 
Okay. Okay, so that was just an example. Oh, it's going to keep playing. So I find collecting common milkweed to be one of the most commonly collected species and also one of the more difficult ones. Um, just because of the down that's on the end of the seeds, which is why I did the video. It wasn't really great, but essentially what um, I was trying to show is that it's easiest if you can harvest it in the field rather than taking a full pod home and then trying to pull the seeds off um, the down when you're in the house. I don't know if anyone's ever tried that. You know, you're pretty much you have that down everywhere um, for years. I constantly keep finding more under my couch from like two years ago. So what I do is what was pictured there is just kind of pulling the seeds off um, while you're out in the field and putting it right into the bag um, so much easier and not worrying about whether or not you harvest all the seeds um, just kind of get whatever you know whatever's easiest and if you leave some of the seeds in the field even the better because you remember you're not supposed to be collecting all the seed anyway. And so this is um, Joe Pie Weed. So it is typical of a lot of our, um, you know, asters, goldenrods, a lot of our native species have that really fluffy seed, um, which can be pretty easy to collect. Um, but there's, anyway, I'll just show the video and it'll kind of explain itself. Sorry, Laura, do you mind uh, sharing the audio for that oh for sure sorry did you not get audio for the other one i think it might have been muted oh no okay whoops so let me see here um, I'm not seeing how to do that. If you just go to where you share your screen, um, when you're selecting the screen, there should be a share with audio uh, check mark button. Oh, hey, it's not actually. There we go. Okay. Is that working okay, better? I also share with you on how I harvest yep. some of our other stuff. Okay. So another one that is ready to harvest right now is Joe Pie, which um, conveniently enough grows for us anyway, right beside the common milkweed. Um, so Oops. when I first started out harvesting, I used to snip off the branches and just shove them in the bags. And that's the way I did it. Um, and I've, ch I've changed the way I do that now. So I, uh, do like the common milkweed. I harvest in the field and I just feel like it makes my life so much easier. So I just take the plant. This is a little bit more awkward because I'm trying to film it at the same time. Um, just hold it in the paper bag and, you know, it goes smoother normally than this because I have two hands to do this and then shake the seed off into the bag. Um, and the benefit of that is that you're getting just the seed and you will obviously get the chaff, the fluff, especially with the Joe Pie, but what you're not getting is all the stems and the leaves that normally um, I would end up having to clean out of the seed as well. Um, and another benefit is that you're letting the stalk sit. So you're just lightly brushing off the seeds that um, are ready for harvest and have matured. And the other ones that might be on the on the stem that haven't are still able to, you know, harvest mature and set seed and there'll be more Joe pie in the world, uh, which to me is a great, great thing. 
Um, okay, so that's um, essentially how I harvest a lot of the fluffier seeds. Um, it just makes life a lot easier, essentially, if you can do as much as possible in the field. Um, it saves a lot of time kind of down the road when you're trying to clean it, um, especially if it's a nice sunny day out, just do it out there. Um, by all means, if you don't have the time, you can cut the stalks off and then just kind of brush the seed um, into a paper bag after. So once you've harvested, um, you do want to clean the seed a little. Um, for most home gardeners, it's not a huge process that you should worry about. Um, you essentially just want to get away a lot of the stems and leaves. You don't have to worry about some of the finer material. Um, so pictured here are, so the top left is um, Missouri ironweed. The middle is turtlehead and the top right is foxglove beer tongue. So kind of very different um, ways of harvesting them and cleaning them. Um, turtle head in the middle, I love. They, the seeds just mature into these perfect little cups and you can just tip them right into a container and the work is done for you. Whereas foxglove beer tongue, which is one of our uh, penstemons, uh, it, they really, nature couldn't make it harder. So the seed pods there that you see, um, that's just the seed pod, the seeds are inside of it and it, they create a really hard shell. Um, they do open up in the season, but even when they open, um, they don't open entirely. So you kind of have to crack them open. So what I do is that I, I do cut the full stalk of that. I put it in a, um, a plastic bag and I step on them. <laughs> or um, what we have done in the past is put them on a metal tin um, tray and then just get a kind of like a meat tenderizer like those hammers and just you're trying to smash the seed pod open. Um, and that doesn't typically harm the seed at all. Um, Penstemon seeds are really, um, they're, they're sturdy. And uh, so that's just kind of, you kind of have to know what you're doing and kind of be inventive sometimes um, when you're collecting or cleaning the seeds. Some of the tools that I use are, um, so different sieves. So pictured is a seed cleaning um, sieves. They can be actually surprisingly quite expensive. Um, so often what I do is just get um, kitchen strainers with different gauges. So you can get wire ones um, and then the ones with the larger holds like a pasta strainer. And what you're doing is just straining out the different plant material out or if the seed is small, the seed is gonna fall through and what's left up top is the plant material that you don't need. Um, other tools of the trade I use are a vacuum. It's just a small handheld little vacuum, typical kind of what you would use in your car. And how I use that is to vacuum up all the really light chaff or chaff is just um, seed material that or seed pod kind of material that isn't the seed um, and the hair dryer you're blowing it out lightly um, so other tips um, when you are cleaning the seed because it can be really dusty and there's lots of little airborne little particles flying around it's the best if you do it in a well ventilated area wear a mask if you're doing it for a long period of time um, also just don't try to aim for perfection, especially if you're just using it for your own purpose. Um, you know, just try to get it so that you can see where the seed is, make sure the seed is healthy and viable. Um, don't worry about getting it overly clean. It's not gonna harm the seed to store it with other plant material as long as it's properly dried. Um, and don't worry about trying to harvest and keep all the seed. If you lose a certain percentage of seed, um, don't worry about it. What I do, I have kind of like seed waste bins um, where I know for sure I've lost say like five or 10% of my seed. And I just take that out to this little meadow area and tip it in there. So that way I know I'm not like, you know, composting it and wasting the seed. Um, and so pictured here on the top left is the smooth blue aster. Um, so here we have on the left is a non-viable seed and on the right is a viable seed and you can see uh, pretty easily the difference between the two. 
Um, one is quite weathered and not looking so great. The other one's kind of plump. Um, and that's really what you want to look for and making sure that your seed looks healthy and viable. You can get a little loop like a magnifying glass and cut into a seed to make sure the embryo is there and that it looks healthy. Um, but for the home gardener, that's not necessarily necessary. You can usually eyeball it and make sure that the seed looks good. And below that is gray-headed coneflower. Um, it's also, these seeds are similar to like a black-eyed Susan or the branched coneflowers. And the seed is the little black piece there and all this light colored brown stuff is what we call chaff. It's just part of the plant material um, that's in the seeds. And this can be really hard to separate because they're the same size. So for the home gardener, don't worry about separating that. And pictured on the right is just some different types of seed. Top right is the smooth blue aster. The middle is a blue vervain and the bottom is common milkweed. Now, when it comes to storing your seed, you really wanna make sure that the seed has dried out properly. Um, so remember that it to dry it in a well ventilated area for about three to five days. So I dry our seeds in our greenhouse. Um, you can bring it inside just to make sure that um, it is a nice dry area um, with good airflow. Um, if it is summer, you, it's best to kind of do it outdoors, I find, as long as it's an enclosed space that's getting um, good airflow. And then once the seed is dried um, and cleaned, um, you can bag it up or put it in an airtight container. So you can just use a Ziploc baggie kind of like this. Um, mason jars are fine as long as they're airtight, Tupperware, and then just pop it in your fridge. Um, don't put seed in your freezer though. There's no need for that. Um, storage time for seeds. So like how long a seed is viable. It really depends on the species and the seeds. Um, but there is, so Mary Gartcher, who I'm crediting here at the bottom, she's a restoration ecologist in Ontario and she's done a lot of research onto how long seeds um, are viable for. So this is some of her work here. So most asters and goldenrods, about a year. So refrigeration typically will prolong that. So you can probably get a little bit longer than what's here, um, but the, they don't last as long as some other species. So grasses and sedges, three to five years. Um, fruiting shrubs, three to five years or more. A lot of the tree species is almost indefinite. And then on the right here are um, a few spe species specific ones that have their longevity. Um, I usually just try to go for a year with most species. Um, but that's because we're selling our seed and we want to make sure that we're selling the best seed possible. If you're not sure, um, say your seed's a few years old and you don't know if it's still viable, you can do a seed viability test. So there's two, there's the water test and the germination test. And essentially the water test is, like it says there, you just put the seeds in um, like a mason jar or water container and um, if they sink, they're still viable. And if they float, they're not. Um, that doesn't work for all seeds though. So it's not 100% accurate. Um, if you wanna know for, for certain, um, you should do a germination test. So with native plants though, that does involve having to go through a process um, often of the cold moist stratification. So it can be a bit more labor intensive than what's just put here about um, just trying to germinate them, um, for, you know, on a paper towel. Um, I always say, just try it. Okay, so what differentiates um, native plants or growing native plants from seeds to like what most people are familiar with, say like annuals or vegetables, um, is essentially the stratification process. And all that really is, is that you're trying to mimic um, the experience of spring and winter, sorry, winter and spring. 
Um, so what is kind of stratification? A lot of the time people hear cold stratification or cold moist stratification. It's essentially the same thing. Um, and that's because seeds have evolved to have these protective barriers, um, chemical cues to know when to break out of dormancy and germinate. The soaking rains of fall followed by the freeze thaw action of winter will break that physical barrier to allow for germination. And the change in light conditions can also trigger hormonal changes um, to begin the germination. So mimicking this process is what is called cold moist stratification. Um, and it's just a technique used to stimulate the real world conditions a seed would receive outdoors typically. Um, and there are other methods um, for breaking dormancy of a seed. So there's scarification, hot water treatment. Um, so scarification is essentially you're manually breaking that seed coat. So like a lupin seed, for example, um, is the most common one. And you would put um, it between like sandpaper and you're kind of physically breaking that um, seed coat down. And um, when you're buying your seeds, the seed provider should be giving you that information about what is needed um, to break dormancy. Um, for most seed guard, uh, you know, people new to growing from seed, especially native plants, I would aim for starting easy uh, rather than going in, you know, with some of our more difficult species. Um, I find a lot of the um, shade ephemerals have a very complicated um, process of breaking dormancy. Some of them take a really long time. Some of them have like a double dormancy. Um, so don't start there. <laughs> you know, start with some of our, our uh, sun species and I'll have some recommended species at the end of the talk to go over with. Um, so when you're doing your stratification, um, species will have different length of how long um, a seed needs to go through that cold and moist period. Um, so typically for most seeds, it's 30 to 60 days. And again, the seed provider should be providing you that information. Um, some species like turtle head is longer. So turtle head is typically about 90 days, uh, but like a lance leaf coreopsis or Indi Indian grass, for example, is 30 days. Um, some of our species that have um, that are kind of dominant throughout a larger landscape of say, um, you can find them in warmer climates, so like down to like Texas or something, you actually don't need to do cold moist stratification for them because they've evolved in such a manner that they don't actually need winter to break dormancy. Um, but by all means, it doesn't hurt. So if you see on, you know, your seed packet, it says, you know, um, cold moist stratification not needed. If you did it, it's not going to hurt. And what I find with a lot of our um, native plants is that it often still helps. So I always stratify the bare minimum of 30 days, regardless of what the species is. And so there's different methods of um, how you can do this, of how you can mimic this cold moist stratification. So there's your, your refrigeration, um, there's fall direct sowing, um, fall winter outdoor treatment and snow planting and we'll get into what those or how we can do those. So for indoors, um, like I said, you don't want to do that in the freezer. Um, what you're doing is you're just putting your seeds in a Ziploc bag is what I use um, when I'm doing it in the fridge or you can put it in like a Tupperware container with moistened sand or peat. Um, and people do put it on paper towel too, and that works. You just wanna make sure that it's not overly wet. So when you're pressing down on your substrate, whether it's sand or peat, that it's not pressing out water. It should only uh, be a little moist and everything should be making good contact with, this, with the seed as well. So you don't want kind of all your seeds in one little tiny pocket you want the seed and the, the substrate to be well mixed together. And of course, to label, um, always label with uh, the date that you put it in there too, so that you know when it's going to be ready. 
Um, and one little tip, um, I do find that some species are really eager. So after the 30 days, um, some things will germinate in the fridge. So I've had this happen with common milkweed and black eyed Susan, um, that they're just super happy to get out there and start growing. So after the 30 days, it's probably best to check on it every couple of days to make sure that um, they're not germinating. And if it has, that's completely okay. You just have to um, plant them sooner than probably you expected. So sowing them indoors is um, typically not too much different than what you would do outside. So you do want to use a soilless, sterile kind of potting soil, something that has um, good light drainage. So a peat moss uh, blend with vermiculite or perlite, any sort of um, seeding mix is great. Um, you want to really make sure that there's drainage. Um, and also don't bury your seeds. Um, I find this is often one of the biggest things that people do wrong uh, the first time around in growing native plants for seeds. Um, and one thing that's always worked for me, um, and this goes with all seeds, not just native plants, but you want to sow your um, seed at twice the, the depth that the length of the seed is. So if it's a very tiny seed, you're actually not um, burying it. You're just sprinkling it lightly on top of the soil and you can actually just sprinkle a little bit of um, potting soil over top of it, but you're not burying it. Um, and a lot of the really small seeds like uh, vervain, for example, actually needs light to germinate. So you don't want to bury them too deep. Whereas if you are sowing a cup plant, for example, which has a very large seed that's the size of about a sunflower, you are going to want to push that in and bury it. Seedling care. Um, so after you've sown your seeds, you just want to put them somewhere warm. So most seed just needs warmth to germinate. Um, a few species do need light cues. Um, but essentially you just want the soil to be warm. So you just put that somewhere you can get heating trays. Um, top of your fridge is a really great place to do that um, or a south facing window. Once they've germinated, they will obviously need light. Um, so just putting there somewhere where they're gonna get light um, like a south or west facing window um, or you can get grow lights too. Um, you just wanna make sure that there's good airflow um, and to avoid damping off, which is the scourge of all, growing all things from seed, um, it, that's just a fungus. So to avoid it, uh, make sure that there is good airflow, that you're not watering or overwatering, and that your potting soil equipment, your pots or your seed trays are clean. So that's usually the biggest problem um, with damping off is that it's a fungus that's been carried over year to year, either in your reused soil or reused containers. Um, and also an important thing is to really kind of thin the herd here. So these are wild uh, bergamot monarda growing. Um, so you can take tweezers out and pull out some of these because you'll see there's quite a few seedlings in there. Um, and that will ensure that you'll get kind of like a healthier stock. Okay, so now you can do seed trays outdoors too. So this is the method I use. Um, it's because you're just taking advantage of winter, of mother nature, it's so much easier. So I sow my tree, my seed, sorry, in fall. I sow them directly into seed trays. Um, as pictured there, there's a little cup plant sprouting. Um, I find that you have more control this way rather than sowing directly in the dirt in your garden. Um, but at the same time, you're um, taking advantage of mother nature and letting her do some of the work for you too. Um, so I sow them directly in the seed trays, put them outside um, somewhere where I know they're not gonna get trampled on, driven on, walked on. Um, if you do have a problem with voles or mice or rodents, you can kind of wrap the seed tray in wire. Um, 
And then for larger areas, so say you want to do like a field or a, um, you know, a garden or something, you can direct so um, in in the field. Um, so it is ideal kind of for species that have a high germination rate that are really easy to germinate. So like a black eyed Susan or Coreopsis milkweed, for example. Um, I would actually say common milkweed, I don't even grow in containers. It doesn't like being grown in, in containers by seed. Um, that one I would just direct sow um, outdoors. So if you are direct sowing in the ground, um, you do have to do a little bit of prep work. Um, I know there's like, you know, all that fanciful belief that you could just toss out wildflower seeds out into your lawn and, you know, next year you have a meadow. Um, that isn't really the case, unfortunately. So what I always say, the better prepared you are, um, the more success you will have. So really you want to make sure that the seeds have really good contact with the soil. Um, so what that means is if you're sowing into an area that has vegetation, whether it's lawn, weeds, removing as much of it as possible um, and then raking the soil up so it's a little loose and then sowing the seeds and lightly raking the seeds into that light already loose soil. Um, you can kind of walk on it to make sure that it's tamped down. Um, but yeah, you don't have to worry about burying the seeds. You can just lightly rake it in with like um, a hard rake. And then in the following years, there always is maintenance. Um, we've done a couple like meadow installations. And uh, one thing we always talk about is the maintenance, especially in the first kind of three years um, when seeds are starting to get it established. Um, you wanna make sure that they have the least amount of competition possible. So in the first couple of years, weed whacking, um, watering, which usually you don't need to water, but definitely you have to weed whack because, you know, while there's exposed soil, what's happening is that you're also awakening potentially a, a weed seed bed that's already there. And you're also creating um, a welcoming environment for weed seeds to blow in. So making sure that you're stopping those seeds from um, going to seed so weed whacking, usually um, midsummer um, for the first few years, because it can take some species three to five years to get established. Uh, what I always say is that the first year it sleeps, um, second year leap, um, and third year it flowers. So I think the saying is actually a little bit different. I should have written it down. Um, so if you are sowing a large area, um, this is kind of typically how much seed you will need. So for about a hundred square foot, foot. So hard wildflower seed, this is what's pictured here. So I think this is branched coneflower. Um, and so the fluffy seed, so typically like grasses, asters, joe pie, that kind of stuff is a lot lighter. So you'll need more of that seed to cover the same amount of area going by weight. Um, and one thing I did want to mention too, if you are sowing seeds in, um, in the field, it's best to take that seed mix um, or just the single species and mix it with sand or peat moss. Um, so you have like a larger, um, something larger to spread and this makes it more visible. So when you're, cause often if you're sowing just the seeds, the seeds are so small that you don't see where you've dropped the seed by mixing it with sand, you're putting it down and you're able to see where the seeds have actually been sown. Um, makes it so much easier. Okay. And so seeds to start with, I've listed some of our most easiest species that I find. Uh, to work with. They generally, generally, sorry, have, um, they tend to grow faster. So is, for example, like a black eyed Susan, you won't get a flower perhaps in the first year, but you definitely will in the second year. You might get one in the first year. 
Uh, same with lance leaf coreopsis. So it's you get more reward a little bit quicker. Um, some other species can take, you know, several years for flowers to come. So if you're new to this, I would suggest, you know, starting with something that's a little bit easier, um, something that doesn't have a complicated stratification um, requirement either. And so that's actually everything. So now we can actually open it up to questions. Um, so Aaron, I don't know if you've been moderating the questions or if people yeah. can. Okay. So what I'd like people to do is if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll just uh, ask you to unmute. I get to go through just a couple quick questions we had during the webinar. I think most of them are fairly quick to answer. Um, one from Harriet is, is there any harm in planting with the plant material not getting completely clean seeds? No, not at all. So it's completely fine. Um, there's no harm in it at all. What I always try to remember, um, especially when it comes to gardening at all with native plants, is you have to think like what happens when nature does it. So, you know, um, when winter comes and throws down a whole Joe pie stem, um, that's how it grows. So that's completely fine. It's not going to hurt it. Um, it. It just depends. So if you're storing that seed, say in the fridge, um, you just want to make sure that anything that you store with it is completely dry. So if there's still leaf mat leaves or stems that it's dry as well. Uh, okay, next one is uh, Vi uh, asking about a video to show how to clean and prep seeds and maybe that's something we can work on. Um, so less of a question, more of a request. Um, is it okay to sor store seed in paper bags? And this one came in when you were talking about uh, like refrigeration of seeds. Um, so is it okay to store them in paper bags? Um, you can. So in the fridge, I wouldn't store it in paper bags in the fridge just because there's the, your refrigerator has a lot of moisture with, um, you know, the door opening and closing and different food content going in there. So I mean, you can see that kind of like moisture will sometimes build up on the inside of your refrigerator walls. And so what can happen is that um, the moisture will seep through the paper because it's permeable and the seeds will um, obviously absorb that. And um, if you, and that's going to be a cue for germination. So you don't want them or they can rot as well. I've seen seeds that just get rotten um, because of moisture content. So storing them temporarily short term is completely fine um, in paper in paper bags, uh, just not in the refrigerator. Um, quick quick note too, if you could go back to the last slide, just so that people can maybe cop copy yep. down the suggested species. Uh, another question. Uh, if your seeds have germinated in the fridge earlier than you expected and before frost is gone, what should you do with them? So the only thing you could probably do is get some potting soil and sow them indoors, which is fine. You'll just have, um, you know, an earlier start to the season. Um, yeah, there's no harm in it whatsoever. You'll just have to have them inside in your house longer than perhaps you were planning. Uh, okay, another one. What would be the advantages of seed trays versus winter sowing in containers with a top on? Um, so the advantage for winter sowing um, outdoors with a top on, was that the question? Yeah, so the yeah. difference between um, seed trays, so I assume inside yeah. um, versus winter sowing with the top on. So when I seed in the trays over winter. Um, I don't have tops because what I want is the snow to still fall on the seed tray. Um, and, you know, for the seeds, for the soil to absorb the moisture and go through that process. Um, I do see pictures of people that have those little clear plastic domes over them and put them outside. Um, to me, that doesn't make sense because you're stopping that process of the snow going on the seed tray, um, but it still could work. I've never actually tried it. I don't know what the benefit is, to be honest. Uh, for me personally, what I would do is um, take the dome off throughout the winter 
um, let this the snow go over the seed tray and then once the weather's warmed is put the dome on because um, the dome is there just to um, increase humidity for the plants to germinate for the seeds to germinate. Uh, okay, next question. Uh, do you have any experience direct sowing into a lasagna gardening style bed with straw slash cardboard layers? Um, yeah, so there's been a, so we have little grow plots on our um, property um, and how we created them was actually just, it wasn't through lasagna layering, uh, but it was similar. So we had a chicken tractor. And so the chickens were all living in these little like square pens. They pooped and then we'd move them on. But it was like that. It was like compacted thick layer of chicken poo, um, which is similar to like, it was really heavy. Um, so we just had to let it sit for a little while um, to kill all the, the plant material underneath it. Um, so similar, to, so if it's, you know, cardboard or something like that, um, you just have to wait till that whole process is done. Um, if you're throwing seeds or putting seeds directly on um, the cardboard, even if it's decomposed, um, you might not get the best germination. Um, you'll probably want to wait till the end of the season. So we've done lasagna um, kind of mulching before. Um, and I find it takes uh, a year or one full season to really be effective. Uh, okay, next question is about uh, stratification requirements. I think that's something that we can include in an email to all participants. Um, so I'll do a little bit of research into websites that might have that and I'll include that in a follow up email when we have the um, webinar on our website. Yeah, uh, and I'll say too, like, um, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but stratification methods, it should be provided by the seed provider, but there is um, a company in the States, so a native plant um, seed provider called Prairie Moon. Their website has um, everything. So they have different codes for all the germination requirements. So for lance leaf coreopsis, for example, it has cold moist stratification 30 days. So you, if you don't know, if you have seeds and you're wild harvesting them and you don't know what the stratification method is, um, I would re recommend checking um, Prairie Moon out. They have everything, every species, they've done all the work. <laughs> uh, any comment about transplanting, for example, wild flocks? Um, so there's different types of, so the blue flocks, the woodland flocks, transplants really easily, um, I find. Um, yeah, I've never had an issue with moss flocks, the native moss flocks, I've never tried, but I imagine it would as well. Um, I haven't grown either from seed though, um, only from plant material, but once they've become established, I find that they're easy to, to, to transplant or move around. Uh, okay. Next question. I sowed seeds outdoors in flats last fall. There are a number of various seed types. Based on your comments, does that mean that if some seeds do not sprout this spring, that they may still grow next year or the year after? So yeah, it is possible. Um, I definitely have had that experience where stuff has not germinated in the first year, and then they have the following year. This is um, more common with um, woodland plants. Um, a lot of our sun loving prairie type species typically will germinate in the first year. Um, but if you have the space and the patience, you can leave them out and see what what happens. Because um, what it, it could have, um, the seeds could have just um, not got the cue properly to germinate. So leaving it out there for a second season, you never know. Okay, we still have a few more. Um, this is fantastic that we have this many questions. Um, is it too late to winter sow right now? Um, so typically, no, it depends on the species though. So if you're looking at something with a 30 day stratification requirement, so most of our plants have that, um, you know, March is still cold enough. 
so but if you're looking at some species at 60 days or 90 days it could be a little too late um, but what you can do if you're on a time crunch is do that in the fridge so um, do the whole cold moist stratification in the Ziploc baggie put it in the fridge for the 60 days and then um, sow that into trays outdoors or in the garden um, that way you're extending winter for that seed um, but if depending on where you are as well located um, you should be fine for most species to, to just kind of do it now um, and can you go into a little bit more depth about the weed whacking would you whack down the whole area including the wildflowers are you more selective in that yep so um this is a lot to do with like meadow, so establishing meadows. Um, but what you want to do is, so you're tr you're not weed whacking the native plants that you've sown. Within the first three years, usually what's growing is uh, weeds, <laughs> to be honest. Um, so in the first year, your um, say June, July, you get a lot of the non-native grasses that flower or set seed earlier in the season. And you can just take the weed whack, weed whacker through there and stop them from going to seed. Um, and then at the end of the season, um, with some of the late flowering weeds or um, grasses as well, um, you can do that again. And why I suggest weed whacking over hand pulling is that sometimes when you hand pull the seeds, what you're doing as well is disrupting um, the native plants or the seedlings that are germinating in the soil, you might not see them. So um, going through there and just weed whacking or cutting back the established weeds and stopping them from setting seed um, gives the other plant, your native seeds, um, a little bit more of a chance to, to get going. Okay, and our, uh, about the suggested species that we have up, are all of them perennial? Um, Yes and no. So black-eyed Susan and common milkweed are tip are technically biennial. So they live for um, two to three years. They're short-lived. Um, so that's why they, they're great for people to start um, growing these because they tend to get established quite quickly. They flower quickly. Um, they set seed and have high germination rates because they're biennial. That's their whole um, life history so like they create lots of seed because they only have a short time on this earth um, but the rest of the species are uh, perennial but not every seed sorry not every plant um, will live you know for say like 10 years so you do want to allow a little bit of propagation like for example i don't know how long a cup plant itself will live um, but they seed so profusely that you would never know. Once you have one, you have thousands for the, you know, hundreds of years. Um, regarding outdoor sowing in flat slash pots, if my seeds sprout and are overcrowded in the spring, should I hand separate them or you mentioned plucking them out with tweezers? Yes, so I, um, I, it, I find it really hard, especially when I first started growing from seed to take the tweezers to all the seedlings and pull them. Um, but, you know, it's really, it's what you have to do. You just thin the herd. Um, it's best for the seeds. Um, it's best for the plants that are going to be growing. Cause if you're, if um, you're trying to pull them out and then replant them, they're probably not going to grow. Um, so just pull out the ones that don't look like they're viable. Um, and you want, you can have more than one seedling growing in a plug tray typically, um, but you don't want to get any more than like three to five, depending on the species, because then they're just competing for space and resources and um, you, and sometimes you can get them to be quite leggy. And I also find that if it's really um, dense, you're more prone to dampening off as well. So get the tweezers in there. Um, and thin them out a little bit. Uh, and how do you know when your indoor plant is ready to be planted outdoors? Is it when they're large or strong enough or how do you decide? 
So um, two ways, you wanna make sure that the outdoor environment is hospitable for them. So typically that's May long weekend for us um, with daytime temperatures being around like 10 degrees or so. Um, native plants are usually more hardy and tolerant of um, cool, cooler temperatures. Um, but what I do recommend is that um, you harden them off a little because if you're taking them from your house, depending on how warm and cozy your house is and you're putting them outside, it could shock them. Um, typically native plants don't get shocked easily, um, but it is good to harden them off. So you can put them outside in the trays um, and bring them in at night if you want. Um, and then when it comes to the plant itself, you just wanna make sure that it ha has a substantial root stock. So if it's a plug um, that when you're pulling, when you pull the plant out, the plug comes out um, and you see all the white roots. There should be roots from the base of the plant right down to the very bottom of the plug tray. Um, and you should see more than say like three to five roots. It should be somewhat substantial. Okay. Uh, I have, I was given some seeds, zigzag, goldenrod, and hairy beard tongue last year. Some seeds were put, put into the garden, rest restored in an outdoor shed. What is the best way to sow the remaining seed? Um, so I would sow those both either now or you can um, go through the process of stratifying them like in the fridge and then sowing them in the spring. Um, but yeah, so if you do them now, you can put them directly onto the, the snow. I do find that snow sowing um, does result in less germination success, um, just because it, you have higher rate of predation to or foraging because they're just sitting on top of the snow. Um, and there's less food sources out for a lot of um, wildlife this time of year too. So if you have few seeds and you really want to ensure that you um, get the most plants out of those seeds, stratifying them indoors at this point would probably be the best um, to, to get success. A couple questions about a couple other specific plants. Do you have any experience with either Labrador tea or sweetgrass? Um, unfortunately, I don't. Um, Yes, I know sweetgrass is really hard to get a hold of because it's a very popular plant. Um, yes, unfortunately, I don't know. Sorry. Okay, and I think this is the last question um, that I have right now. Out uh, regarding outdoor sown seed in pots, when they sprout this spring, when should I transplant transplant them into the garden? Um. So I've kind of already answered that, I think. So if they're sowing them indoors, was that the question? And when do they put it's, them? They're in pots. Uh, they're just, they're in pots outdoors. Oh, okay. Um, so you've sown them in pots outdoors. Um, I mean, there's no rush, what I always say. Um, you wanna make sure that the plant is really well established before putting it in into the ground. Um, so if it say it germinates in May, um, depending on what the species is, you're probably looking at like late June, early July um, for it to get really well established rootstock. Um, but essentially that's really what you wanna look for. So if you, if you do find that the plants have grown really quickly and are getting, um, the pot is drying out kind of thing because the roots are established, then definitely you want to put those in the garden um, as soon as possible. But keeping them in, in the pot isn't going to hurt them as long as they're being cared for. Okay, so I think that's all the questions. I don't see any other pop popping up. Okay. Um, so I wanted to say thanks everyone for attending. Uh, we're going to have a winter botany a webinar in March. It'll be March 23rd. So if you're interested about learning how to identify trees during the winter, uh, you can tune in for that one. I want to thank Laura so much for doing this. Uh, she's been super great with the Conservancy in the past. We did a native plant webinar last year, which was hugely attended. Um, so huge thank you to her. And I've actually personally purchased some plants from Laura and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how they do this year. 
So thank you so much. Uh, if you have any questions, send me an email and I will be sending out the webinar link and maybe a couple of the other resources um, that we've talked about in this webinar. And Thanks I was going to so suggest too, so there's my contact information and if people do have questions that were not answered, um, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to answer questions as well. Yep. And so our, our both the Conservancy's information and Laura's information was posted in the chat, but I'll attach that to the email as well and get that out to everyone. All right. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Thanks so much. Have a great day and good luck with your seeds. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, everybody.